So Martina, a patient who's gone through surgery and gets adjuvant chemotherapy or the new adjuvant approach or more so sandwich approach, because I am often giving uh, that adjuvant chemotherapy, even if they've been exposed to new adjuvant chemotherapy up front. But then again, coming back to some maintenance therapies options available here, we have PARP inhibitors. This is something that I often get confused with. You and me both. (laughs) So we have BRCA positive patients that you can use it for. You also have this option available for BRCA1 and 2. That's wild type. Who are you using PARP inhibitors for? Oh, gosh. If you had asked me that a year ago, my my answer would be a little (laughs) bit different than it is today. So the data is the strongest, as you know, for women who have either a BRCA mutation or a BRCA-like mutation, some other form of homologous or combination deficiency. So those are the women in my practice that I'm really... I'm really emphasizing the benefit of PARP inhibition. Um, You know, the data has changed a little bit and gotten a little bit confusing, I think, as it's matured. Is there a benefit for PARP inhibition in women who don't have those kinds of mutations or, you know, BRCA wild type, don't have HRD? Yes, there is some benefit, but you have to really weigh that benefit with um, the risks associated with the use of PARP inhibitors, which are not not negligible. Um, So I would say that in my clinical practice, I'm really focusing on using these drugs in women who have, like I said, a, a BRCA mutation, um, somatic or germline, or um, some other form of homologous recombination deficiency. And then for women who, you know, want to feel like they've done every everything known to man, um, you know, to try and prevent cancer recurrence, then, then I talk a little bit about PARP inhibition in that case as well. But I'm really much more um, uh, focused on giving it to women or offering it to women um, who have uh, those those mutations that we just talked about. And it's important because you brought this up. These medications are not benign. Just because they're oral, they give us a false sense or to our patients a false sense of security. We use this for breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer here. And there are some certain side effects that we really have to be mindful about. Absolutely. And I mean, I I have, you know, taken patients who were perfectly fine from a hematologic standpoint and, you know, made them require transfusions and all kinds of things just as a result of using these medications. Um, of course, those are things that are manageable, but they're not benign. Um, and like you said, I think sometimes we get, we forget that these oral medications, um, especially because they, they're taken every single day rather than every, every three weeks or every four weeks, um, they can really have a lot of side effects that we need to think about. And with regards to multiple PARP inhibitors approved in this setting, any partic- because they all have interest in side effects, any particular one that you tend to rely on uh, one over the other at all? I tend to, and this is just, again, my personal preference and, you know, personal use, I tend to rely on olaparib um, when I can. Obviously, um, you know, niraparib has the indication for BRCA wild type um, or or unknown status. So in that situation, if, you know, I can't use olaparib, then I will use niraparib. But my sort of go-to, again, primarily because I'm really emphasizing the use of these drugs in women that have these deleterious mutations, um, is is olaparib. And sometimes, I guess, whichever one provider gets used to as well. Yeah, and that's, yeah. How, that's a lot of oncology, right? With all things being equal, Indeed. we all kind of develop our personal preferences with what we're most comfortable with, um, what we have the most experience using and, and managing side effects from. So, yeah, that's my approach. Indeed. 